about putting at the very end, join the movement, www.thezeitgeistmovement.com. And six, join the movement. Go to thezeitgeistmovement.com and help us create the largest mass movement for social change the world has ever seen. I knew that the moment that it became something more than just a film phenomenon that my life would likely change dramatically, which it has. Zeitgeist Addendum was sparked out of people emailing me saying, well, what do we do about all of these cultural problems? What do we do about a corrupt banking system? What do we do about people that are locked into establishment social programs, if you will, I consider the trains of thought and mind to be a program. I consider society itself to be a program that's running. Uh, and the programming locks people into a specific frame of reference. Um, how do we deal with these issues? How do we do? What do we do? And uh, Zeitgeist Addendum was an attempt at answering that question. After Zeitgeist 1 was released, um, it got into the hands of Jacques and Roxanne, and after reading Jacques' book, which they sent me, I realized that this was really important information. I realized that even I was backwards on a lot of issues that uh, needed to be corrected. And in order to get society in line, we have to think about the fundamental problems. This was something that I was attempting to do in part. I had a notion of, but it wasn't until I met Jacques Fresco that the lens became focused. It was like all these things that I sort of had an inkling of, Jacques' experience, life experience, what he had talked about for song, just focused me in the right direction as far as I'm concerned. So I made a whole section with him in Zeitgeist Addendum, and uh, that's how it took off. Anyone that chooses to challenge establishment orthodoxies, traditional worldviews, not to mention the system that we live in, sets themselves up for venomous attacks. I'm well aware of this. If you look back at the history of anyone that has chosen to challenge the establishment, uh, it's a very dark history. There are a great number of people out there that know that something is wrong, but they do not understand the source of that wrongness because they are in the box of indoctrination. Socrates. Socrates never speculated on the slavery that was existing during his time. That was normality to him. This goes with every type of political philosopher that's ever existed, whether it's Karl Marx, whether it's Plato. Uh, they're all locked into an established paradigm, and their thought processes can only go so far. And this includes probably myself. People are locked into a box. They see the box around them. They see the leaks and the holes and the cracks, and they go up to the cracks and they try to fix them. They try to patch the holes but they don't stop to think that maybe there's something wrong with the box itself. Maybe the integrity of the box that they exist in is inherently invalid, it's inherently void. The economic system that we live in is a parasitic paradigm that is only going to lead to self-destruction, but people don't see that. So if you attack the economic system for what it actually is, everyone's feathers go up. Everyone says, well, wait a minute, this is the world we all live. We live in a profit-based, labor-for-income world, cyclical consumption. This is what we're used to. We understand we have division of classes. You know, they throw in human nature. They throw in everything that will try to make it seem like it's a part of the natural order of reality when it, in fact, is not. Um, if I was to summarize the, um, the attacks that typically happen towards myself and the people I work with, the first one would be credentialism. Credentialism is an annotation for the priesthood of those in the know. Now, bear in mind, this is a gradient of relevance. Obviously, I'm not going to go to a doctor, if I can help it, that has absolutely no credentials in the surgery that I might need performed. They require instruction and experience to do so. But when it comes to the other side of the spectrum, when it comes to the simple analysis of information, when it comes to the analysis of history, when it comes to economics, because it is a contrived system, it has no basis in anything else in general operation. It's not based on laws of physics. It's not based on any aspect of scientific law that has any relationship to planetary operation. Then suddenly it becomes very relevant to speculate as to what these things actually mean to society. It's a double-edged sword when you get a 
master's, bachelor's, PhD in a particular medium, because think about what you're actually doing. You're going through a curriculum that's been completely established for you by the institutions that have existed prior. When it comes to social things that have a great deal of subjective variance, uh, you lose objectivity in that sense because you're literally indoctrinated into the beliefs that are presented. To get a degree in economics, which is probably the most wasteful thing you could possibly do, is to be completely indoctrinated into the idea that what you're studying is actually a science and actually has some type of relevance to anything. So when I get emails from PhDs in economics that try to debunk the aspects that we talk about, it becomes quite clear to me that the reason they have such an objection is really an emotional one. It isn't an objective aspect. They have culminated an identity to themselves because of their belief system. And for me to take that away from them, to debunk their ideas about economics, is to take away their identity. It's easy to point out that some of the greatest minds that have contributed some of the most powerful inventions to our world have come from non-establishment institutions, have worked on their own, they've done their own study, they've guided their own direction of information. They didn't just sit in a classroom and take in the road information, do the step-by-step -step processes as oriented by the establishment, and then grab their diploma and degree, and hey, now I'm an expert in a given field. Uh, the most tremendous minds, the most tremendous contributions comes from those, from those that are outside of the box. I don't even need to give examples of that to make that known. So, back to my point, when it comes to social theory, if you will, credentialism, I give zero weight to. Academia is a detriment to advancing social progress. Another form of attack simply comes from the cultural nuance, comes from the social programming, uh, what we call the self-appointed guardians of the status quo. People that are suffering in the system just like anyone else, but their social identification is so powerful, they are so locked into the box, that they find it infuriating to think that what they're living is actually wrong, paradoxically. I get this all the time from people. The self-appointed guardians of the status quo are birthed in religion, birthed in economics, birthed in the illusion of democracy that we see today across the world, birthed in the, the various isms that are entirely pointless, capitalism, communism, fascism, socialism. You have the priesthood of the monetary system, the capitalists, if you will, you can give it that rhetoric. I don't use that word, it's meaningless. The monetaryism is the word I use. The pretense for acquisition of money is based on differential advantage, which is based on dishonesty, period. Then you have the priesthood of religious concepts, religious identification, and the idea that somehow we know everything already, and there's a God, and he's looking down on us, controlling everything. I won't even go into the paradoxes that come from that extremely narrow notion. So in other words, the biggest crutch to the evolution of human thought is breaking your own indoctrination. It's very, very difficult to overcome emotional elements that have become so ingrained in you that you have an immediate reaction, an immediate suffering and pain when anything interferes with that. It's a very, very complex problem. But I'll say it again. We have to learn how to break, excuse me, we have to learn how to identify and break our own indoctrination if we expect to move forward at all as a civilization. My name was put forward because I wanted to protect my friends and family from the association. People say to me, well, you should, have, you should come out with everything. If you're going to talk about any of this stuff, then you've got to be prepared to deal with all of this and that that you set up for yourself. I had an email that said that to me, uh, criticizing me for not releasing my last name. And, and I thought to myself, you know what? What they're actually saying, anyone who actually says that, is actually saying that Martin Luther King deserved to die or that Gandhi deserved to die for making themselves known. I've gotten many death threats from the religious community. We live in a very fucked up sick culture. We really do. The society is mentally ill. To be normal is to be messed up in this culture. So my name, Peter Joseph, you know, at what point does my identity become absolutely transparent? Should I give people my social security number? Should I give them my tax returns? And just to throw it in there, there are plenty of people throughout history that have gone by their first and middle name, excluding their last name from their general communication and walks uh, in their society, just like people often use their, la their middle name and their last name.